You will make it through. The fifth is awakening you. Wicker and Isuna by your side is a place where it will thrive. You will make it through. You will make it through. The fifth is awakening you. With Quran and Sona on his side, here's a place where it will thrive. You will make it through. With Quran and Sona on his side, here's a place where it will thrive. You will make it through. Okay. <clears throat> Ina Alhamduli La Wasalat Wasalam Allah Wa Rasulullah. I want to welcome everybody uh, back to our uh, series entitled Diluting El Wella Well Baro. Diluting El Wella Well Baro. And uh, this series is all about the correct belief system. And when we talk about the correct belief system, we have to understand what we're talking about. We're not talking about following and practicing the religion. Uh, this is a misunderstanding uh, that a lot of uh, American non uh, or non uh, Arabic speaking English uh, uh, non Arabic speaking uh, Muslims uh, struggle with understanding what's meant by belief system, and that's just an English word. Belief system. When I ask what about your belief system, what I'm basically asking is uh, what is it that you believe in? That's it, basically. I'm not asking about following or practicing. I want to know what do you believe Mr. in? Lena, we can hear you on, on, on Zoom. Oh, oh. Well, these the people heard me on the other channels. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Okay, yes, as I was saying, um, when we ask about your belief system, we're not asking what you follow, what you practice. We're asking what it is that you believe in. And that's where we lose a lot of uh, uh, non-Arabic speaking Muslims because they can't answer that. You know, if we, like we gave, we demonstrated the other day, uh, if a person says, wow, this is why we have to be very careful making statements like this. Uh, wow, your belief system is messed up, man. We got to be careful saying that because what we're saying is, wow, you don't believe in what Allah commanded us to believe in. Wow, you are denying something that Allah has said. Wow, you are denying either Allah's laws or you are denying Allah's rules or you are denying Allah's obligations. So when we break it down like that, you can see how serious a crime it is. I'm not even going to say sin. It's a crime uh, to tell another Muslim that their belief system is messed up. Okay. So we have to be careful with that. You know, uh, a lot of it, it's true that a lot of Muslims don't understand what their purpose is in life today. A lot of Muslims do not understand uh, what, why we were created. A lot of Muslims do not understand what being a Muslim is all about. And that falls on us as a nation because we've deviated away from uh, in our priorities. Instead of us focusing on our children, we've been focusing on this dunya, which is one of the signs of the last hour. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said one of the signs of the last hour is that the people will focus on the life of this world instead of on Allah and their obligations towards him. So we failed as a nation. That's true. You know, our children grow up Muslim in name only. They don't know what it means to be a Muslim. They don't even know what Muslim means. They don't all have the character, the behavior, the attitude of a Muslim. And they definitely don't know what they're supposed to believe in. They don't know the lawful from the unlawful, you know, and that's on falls on the parents, especially the mother. 
And we're living in this genre today of LDB, LGBQ and feminism, women trying to be men, men trying to be women. The, the roles have become blurred as one of my students said. You know, we've blurred the lines in our purpose. We've blurred the lines in our, uh, uh, our uh, roles. So our children have paid the price over the years. And now we have all these uh, Muslims in their 20s and 30s who don't know anything about the dean. They don't even know the basics. And it's because of their parents. You know, we have to remember the children are just a reflection of the parents. OK, just as the woman is a reflection of her man, we talk about how terrible women are today. And it's true. I am a female and I can look around. I'm I'm shocked at some of the things I'm hearing from the women today. Like I was speaking about the other day, I am just amazed. And taken aback as to how so many Muslim women uh, today they don't even understand what their roles are as a wife. You know, when I hear Muslim women make comments to me saying, oh, my husband won't cook and my husband won't clean. I'm like, excuse me? They say, well, it's his job to, to click and clean because the prophet used to cook and clean at home. I'm like, oh my God, who taught you that lie? Who took that beautiful hadith and turned it around and twisted the meaning up? Oh, women don't know. They think it's their husband's job to not only go out and work and provide and maintain you, but they believe it's also their husband's job, you know, to come home after a long day and cook dinner. For you who've done nothing, how did you spend your time? You didn't spend your day cleaning the house. You didn't spend your day uh, taking care of the kids. You spent your day on the internet, talking, running your mouth, hopping around, doing whatever we women do that we shouldn't do on this uh, internet. You know, so you want your husbands, you expect your husbands to not only come home and cook, but also after they get through cooking, they have to clean your house up too. And then after they get through doing that, they have to sit down with the children and go over the children's homework. And then after that, they ask you for some time, personal one-on-one -on -one time, and you women tell them, go sleep on the couch. Oh my God. And we wonder why divorce is so high amongst us. Uh, that's just shocking. I didn't know uh, that you Muslim women uh, were indulging in that type of behavior that you were told this. And then the sisters tell me that imams, famous speakers have told them that. Oh, how twisted are we? You know, so we can only blame ourselves for the lack of knowledge, the lack of understanding, you know, of our religion and, you know, how we become this sad state that we are today. And unfortunately, it's going to get sadder with the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. So anyway, that's why we have these classes. Aqidah, when I talk about the belief system, what am I speaking about? Let's see, just to see who was paying attention to me in this instance. Who can tell me? When we're speaking about our belief system, the belief system of the Muslim, what are we speaking about? Break it down in even more plain English. Let's see if you guys can do it today. You couldn't do it the other day. What is Akita? What is belief system? When I say, wow, how's your belief system? What am I asking you? What am I saying? When someone addresses another Muslim's belief system, what are we addressing? Anyone, wake up in Zoom. Forget the Zoom.
People on Facebook, people on YouTube. What are we talking about? I don't want the famous brothers to answer either. Uh, by the way, we have a attendance here of these uh, personalities. Can anyone tell me what does Akita, 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 the Arabic term Akita belief system refer to? And just so you guys can see, I'm not just speaking to myself. Y'all want to see who the students are that's in my Zoom? Let me open it up. They don't know. There you go. I'm not speaking to myself here. Y'all see them? Okay, Miss Jackson. She said the correct belief system entails believing what Allah has sent down through the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and having no doubt or discontentment with Allah's laws. Good job, Miss Jackson. Good job. So who can tell me what are the articles of belief? Oh yeah, I'm getting ready to throw it out to you. Basic Islam 101. This is what you women should be teaching your children. This is what you brothers should be reinforcing with your wives. Who can tell me what are the articles of belief in Islam? And I want you famous personalities to pay attention. Because this is what you brothers should be talking about. Instead of all that arguing and debating politics and, and, and cussing out the Kafirs and debating the Bible and all that dumb stuff. This is what the Ummah needs to be uh, learning. Who can tell me what are the pillars of belief? Sister Elma, what are the pillars of belief? Geechee, what are the pillars of belief? Layla, what are the pillars of belief? Precious, what are the pillars of belief? None of you guys know, and you've been Muslim all your lives. You were born in the USA and born in Somalia, and y'all don't know what the pillars of belief are. Can any Muslim listening to me tell me what are the pillars of belief? This is a basic man. Um, the pillars of belief are to believe in Allah and his oneness, to believe in all of his angels, his books, his prophets, um, the hereafter, predestination, and to believe that all good and evil comes from Allah. Hmm. What do you guys think? Did she name them all? Did she make, kind of mix them up? Or did she blend and blur the lines? Let's see what we got here on YouTube. Miss Jackson, the six articles of faith. And you're not copying off the internet. or Miss, uh, Miss Jackson, you're not uh, doing uh, Wikipedia, are you? We're not you trying to use Google. The six articles of faith. Allah is the only God. Hmm. All prophets and messengers. Mm -hmm. To believe in the angels. To believe in the day of judgment. To believe, excuse me, in the decree of Allah. The books of Allah. What do y'all think about these answers? <laughs> When we say that we believe that Allah is the only God, what does that mean? You know, how does that differentiate us from a Christian? The Christians believe in God too. Yeah, they believe in God, but they also, their belief system is saying that Jesus Christ is the son of God. We believe that Allah doesn't have any children. You know, okay, but so basically what I'm trying to get y'all to do is rephrase that. 
There's no other deity that we should be worshiping. We believe that in his oneness. Wait a minute, not the oneness. Say that again, Geechee. Y'all keep forgetting the main point. When the we one deity that we should be worshiping. Worship. It's about worship. The first article of faith. We don't believe, it's not we believe in God. How many times have I taught you guys? The Quraysh, did they believe in God? Yes, they used to call upon the God of the Kaaba. The Quraysh believed in Allah. The Christians believe in Allah. The Jews believe in Allah. But what is the problem? They don't believe that he's the only one worthy of worship. Y'all got to get that right. You've been Muslims all your lives. You got children. Some of y'all got grandkids like me and great grandkids. And y'all still don't got these articles of faith down. And you've been a Muslim for uh, 30, 40, 50, 60, some of you 70 and 80 years here. Y'all got to get that. This is what we mean. When you hear a person make that statement, oh, your belief system, you have to work on it. That's, I'm not telling you work on how you practice the sooner. I'm telling you, get it together. What do you believe in? This is what Allah is going to ask us about in the grave. Okay, we believe that Allah is the only deity and worthy of worship. That's the first ar article. Allah is the only deity worthy of worship. In other words, you can, ain't nothing else worthy of worship but him. Not the Kaaba, not the black stone. Not your husband, not your children, not your job, not your money. The only thing worthy of worship in this whole entire universe is a law. That's the first article of faith. And this is what I'm saying. You know, we have to, when the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was approached by the companions and they asked him, they said, oh, prophet of Allah. What should we do if we live to see the fitting or the trials and the calamities that will befall us as a nation, the war, the natural disasters, homosexuality, sex out of wedlock, intoxicants, if we should live to see these horrible things impacting us as a nation, what should we do? How do we overcome? How do we get through the trials? The Prophet wasalam, said, fall back on Allah. Fall back on your belief system. Check your belief system. Check your belief system to see if it is correct and make the changes because Allah sends war. Allah sends those trials. Whenever we deviate away from that, do you guys understand? And this is what you famous personalities, you brothers who these people follow, I don't, they don't follow me. I'm just a woman. I'm just a girl in the world. They don't listen to me. All this debating, this arguing about Christian versus Muslim, and he's a Kafir because he did this, and she's a Kafir because she did that. Y'all need to fall back on Layla Hayala Law. Because as you can see, I'm putting it to the test. These, I don't have any converts in my Zoom room. The people in my Zoom room are born Muslim, okay? These are people from Somalia, from Ghana, okay, from Libya. I even got a couple of uh, uh, Arabs in here from Palestine. Oh, yeah! Gaza! And we can't get the belief together. My new shahadas, Miss Jackson doing a good job. 
Okay. <laughs> so we have to fall back on that. So when we say that we believe in Allah, we're talking about that he's the only one worthy of worship. And I want you guys to word it that way. Only Allah is worthy of worship. Okay, break that down. Okay, and what's the other one she said? I think it was another one that she worded. Let me go back. Six articles of faith. Only Allah is the only Allah is worthy of worship. We also believe in all the prophets, all the messengers. We don't make no distinction. We believe in all of Allah's angels. We believe in all of Allah's books. Now, that's another problem we have today. When we say we believe in all of Allah's books, what does that mean? That means that I should have a Bible sitting on my, st so should I have a, as a part of my library? And by the way, how many of you Muslims have emailed me asking me which Bible should you buy? Because you wanna make sure you got the best one as part of your library. Because I got Muslims here who have uh, copies of the Torah, the Bible, and the Quran on the same shelf. So, what do you say about that? When we say that we believe in all of Allah's books, what are we basically saying? Break it down in plain, simple, grassroot English. We believe the books. Um, when Allah sent it to the messengers, but they know uh, they are no longer in existence. So what we have today, those are not proper. So I don't know why people have them, but we do believe that they were in existence and that they came to a time to the people at the time that they should have been and they used or whatnot. But we believe in it. They just no longer exist. Okay. And why come they don't exist? Uh. Because we have the Holy Quran, they have been eradicated. We have the Holy Quran, and that's the seal. So that's it. Okay. No Muslim on this planet, I repeat, and this is for you famous brothers, that this includes you too. No Muslim on this planet should be reading a Bible. No Muslim on this planet should be reading a so called Torah either. Because Allah is clear in the Quran. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was clear. Those books don't exist. Allah says when every time he sent a book of revelations, it replaced what came before it. And he destroyed what came before it. Allah says, if you want to know what was in the Bible, you want to know what was in the Torah, read the Quran. So I don't know. This is a big innovation. Muslim children growing up, learning the Bible. Do you guys know I received an email today? Uh, from one of the some one of the new followers here, he's starting college, and he was saying that he's going to change his major. He was originally uh, going to school for computer engineering, but he decides that he's going to change his major to theology. I said, "What? He wants to learn about the Bible." And learn the Bible so he can give dawah. A stock fear. That's how twisted we are. And that's the damage that you brothers with all your debates have done. And you brothers are going to have to answer to a law for that. On the day of judgment and in your graves. How you picked up these Bibles and Torahs. When Allah already told you those books don't exist, if you want to know what was in them, you read the Quran. And you've learned those books. Instead of learning the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, instead of learning what the Prophet said, when Umar, ready Allahu Anha, got his hands on the Torah and he started reading from it, 
and trying to compare it with what Allah said in the Quran. The prophet got angry. You don't know that hadith. But you brothers have gotten these man-made books and you're going through them, taking verses, trying to say this is what Allah meant, compared it to the Quran. And you don't know what the prophet said about that? That's haram. We don't do that. You don't know if that verse is true or not. Like the prophet told Umar, you want to know what Allah said? It's in the Quran. The Ten Commandments in the Quran. The story of Job in the Quran. Story of Noah in the Quran. You brothers are the reason why the Muslim youth today, children born Muslim, come from Muslim families are reading, walking around with Bibles. James, King James, the homosexuals, Bible in their pocket, reading it. And they don't know anything about what the correct belief system is. Okay. So we believe in Allah's books, but don't none of them exist except the Quran. We believe in the original. This is the wording. What is the wording you guys should use? You should say, we believe in the original, all the original books that Allah sent. All the original books. That's it. Because the books that are here today are not original. Is the Book of Mormon, is that from Allah? The Jehovah Witness book? I mean, come on, people. That's what that hadith means. Fall back. Fall back, fall back on la ilaha illallah. Ibn Abbas said, oh prophet, how will the people, what we sustain, all this war, all this, this terror going on, how will the Muslims even make it through? He said, those that will make it through will make it through because of their la ilaha illallah, their true belief, their true understanding of what they're supposed to believe in. When the war comes to America, I'm sorry guys, most of us here in America are not gonna make it as Muslims because most of us in America don't even know what the correct belief system entails. We'll succumb, we'll succumb to the, the, to the, uh, the terror, if the Antichrist comes, we'll be following him, thinking he's God because our belief system was not correct. Like the prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also said, when those major signs from Allah occurs, when they happen, it'll be too late. It'll be too late to change and try to say, I'm okay, I'm gonna learn my deen correctly now. You won't be able to do it then. It'll be too late. Do you sisters understand that? Do you brothers understand that? So this is why it's important out of all the lectures I give, I know I got a lot of emails from a lot of people. A lot of you love my classes. All my classes are popular. I'm getting more and more uh, uh, people following me because they want to learn the truth. But out of all the classes I teach, this is the most important. If you don't have the correct belief system, guys, you're not gonna make it through the trials of life. If you don't have the correct belief system, you will have a bad, ending in that grave and on the day of judgment. So you have to pay attention to this class. You have to take notes in this class. All right, let's see what else I got here. Um, let's see, Brother Tarek. My brother Tarek, let's see what he wrote here. He said, for such as controlling whether we believe in the books that he has sent that the Bible, Torah, Psalms were all real, but the only true and only untouched book now is the Quran. Exactly. So, but basically, Brother Tarek, you just say we believe in all of Allah's original books. That's it. 
One that one simple word, original. The original that changes the whole that that seals it with a kiss. We be, believe in all the original books that are lost sent. The only original book that is still in existence is the Quran. That's it. So, yes, I believe in the original Bible. I believe in the original Torah. I believe in whatever other original books are lost sent. But I don't believe in none of this crap today except for the Quran. None of this crap today. And that's what it is. It's crap. Whatever exists today other than the Quran. I repeat, whatever exists today other than the Quran. And we don't sugarcoat the deen. We don't sit here. I don't need to get no emails from you compassionate imams in Texas. Y'all know who I'm talking to. Many of you used to be on my website. Don't send me no emails telling me that I'm rough and tough. I'm supposed to be rough and tough when it comes to this Akita. That's the problem. Had you brothers been rough and tough instead of supporting the LGBTQ like y'all doing, we wouldn't be so messed up here in America. So don't send me no emails. It's crap. Allah says any books other than his are crap. That's what they are. It's crap. Ain't no Bible on this planet today. It's crap. Ain't no Torah here. It's crap. That's the reality. Do you people understand that? We don't sugarcoat the reality so that Muslims are afraid to speak the truth so they don't even know the truth. How does the truth become forgotten? That's another sign of the last hour. The prophet said truthfulness will disappear. How will it disappear? It'll become forgotten because the Muslims will be have said imitate the Kafir and try to sugarcoat to appease them. So the truth is forgotten. Don't send me no emails because I don't read them anyway. When I see y'all's name on it, it's trashed. All right. Yeah, I'm not like these typical women. This is Layla Nasheba. This ain't these uh, internet, what you call them, social influencer women who forgot their role, forgot their place and their purpose. This is Layla. All right. So let's see what else I had here. Miss Jackson, the Quran was sent. Let me see what she wrote. This is one of my new ones. The Quran was sent and perfected religion and Allah preserved it. But the unoriginal, good job. Original, good original. Good job, Miss Jackson. Let's see. Brother uh, Adam, I just know love. What the heck is that? <laughs> Mina. You see what Adam wrote? I just know love. Let me tell you something. Don't blur the lines, brother Adam. Don't blur the lines. We ain't that turn the other cheek, people. You don't slap me and I'm going to turn my cheek and say, here, slap me again. You slap me. I'm trying to take you to the graveyard, Aki. <laughs> what you mean, love? God is love. <laughs> Let's see what Pamela wrote. Exactly. Did you want to say that? Huh? What'd you say, Layla? What'd you say? <laughs> Y'all see that? I just know love. <laughs> Brother Adam. <laughs> I said Adam will say that. Adam will say that. Yeah, and look what else he wrote. <laughs> My show. May Allah bless you, Brother Adam. I mean. <laughs> Okay, let's see. Okay, he said, I love you. Do you owe? You ain't trying to pick me up now, Brother Adam. This ain't no pickup. Hello. Y'all see why the women, let me tell let's talk about that. Thank you for putting this on the screen, Brother Adam. This is why also, guys, um, a law, you know, as a Muslim woman, we're not supposed to become a public spectacle. 
We can't make a public spectacle of ourselves, all right? So whenever we go public outside the house or like I am, even on the internet, Allah commands the believing women in the Quran, be loud in your voice, which also interprets, to, interprets as my uh, uh, Arabic teachers here, the Fusha teachers like Dr. Asim and them have informed. That Arabic word means be loud, be firm, be intimidating in your voice. That's why I speak the way I do. That's why I put my Barbara Walters voice on and I do my face like this. Be intimidating because you never know what lurks in the heart of man. Brother Adam, you better not be trying to pick Layla Nasheba up. It ain't happening. I'll be single till I die and I'll marry the prophet Muhammad. I'll join Aisha. <laughs> All right. So anyway, let's see. A good answer. Let's see. Uh, brother, let's see. Um, um, what else we got? <laughs> okay, so mashallah, that's how I want you guys to word that stuff. Be careful. And I want you all to fall back. Do like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. We need to fall back, fall back on our uh belief. La ilaha illallah will sustain you. That hadith, Sahih Muslim. When those calamities, if you live to see this uh, gender, uh, homosexuality, marriage, uh, people having sex out of wedlock, drugs, alcohol, music, women dressed but still naked, you know, the men not uh, and have reversed their roles with the women. You live to see that. What will sustain you is la ilaha illallah. That's what that hadith means. What will sustain you? is your belief system. If you are truly upon the correct belief system, evaluate yourself and re-evaluate and re-evaluate and re-evaluate. You guys get it? Do you brothers and sisters get it? That's what that hadith is about. And so today for this class, diluting wala wal bara. We just completed the chapter of this book. And by the way, please make sure if you don't have this book, purchase it. And also purchase the first of the series, Get to Know Your Lord. Because when I'm done with this book, we're almost done. I'm going to go back to the first book, Get to Know Your Lord, which breaks down the meaning of that Shahada. So buy both of them. You might get a discount. So go to Amazon.com. I don't know if they discounted or not. I'm just saying. But go to Amazon.com and purchase the book, Diluting El Wala Wal Bara. It's on Amazon. This is the red one. You need to get all three of them, the blue one and the first one, which is Get to Know Your Lord. They're all written by Sheikh Kareem Abuze. May Allah bless him. May Allah forgive him of his sins. I mean, I mean, I mean, and may this be a, a baraka for him, which I know it will be because, oh my God, he doesn't know how many Muslims' lives he has impacted, you know, through my teachings here of these books. Okay. So make sure you guys get a copy of the book. And so we completed the chapter. Yeah, we completed the chapter addressing sports. Well, now we're going to move to the next chapter, which is very interesting. Entertainment. How do we implement allegiance? and disassociation in the world of entertainment. We're going to answer the question that many of you have about, is it haram to watch TV? Is it haram to go to the movies? Is it haram to listen to music? We're going to cover all of that in this chapter. So everybody take notes. For the parents here, 
Put me on the big screen TV for the children. Yes, my, my classes are all family oriented. Yeah, the children should be sitting in here learning from me. Okay? Put me on the big screen TV channel, Sooner Followers. And by the way, on all the other social platforms, you know, I'm streaming live on YouTube. I'm streaming live on Facebook. I'm streaming live on X. I'm streaming live on Rumble. Rumble's in the house. I got a lot of followers on Rumble's now. Yeah, mashallah. Rumble, I'm also streaming on Odyssey. And I'm streaming on LinkedIn. That's my Arabic people here. Wait a minute, let me make sure y'all. Yeah, I see you, brothers. Yeah, that's where brothers are here and them all are. They're all on LinkedIn, my Arabic people from uh, the Emirates and stuff are here too. Mashallah, I got some brothers and sisters here from Saudi Arabia too. May Allah bless you all. Give my salam to the families. Hello, hello. So whatever platform that you're using is use the, the channel. You can find our channel by typing Suna followers, you know, so just put us on channel Suna followers on the big screen TV or whatnot. And Alhamdulillah, uh, the kids can see. And I want the parents to take screenshots of my PowerPoint because I teach with PowerPoint. I put the Hadiths there and the sources screenshot it. All right. So let's put the PowerPoint up on the screen for this uh, session. And I do have my computer working. The other one, I got to use three computers. Bang. There's a second one. <laughs> Y'all see the second computer just popped up. Bang. And I'm getting ready to use the third computer. Where's my third computer? Let me get over here. Y'all ready for the third one? Boom. There's the third one, three computers. I'm an octopus. See there, I'm working all these hands. All right, so tonight we'll be covering pages 515 through 518. Can everybody see that? This is the book, Diluting El Wala Wal Bara, volume two by Sheikh Karim Abu Zaid. May Allah bless him. Okay, and this begins the chapter of how to implement El Wala Wal Bara in entertainment. Let's take a look, see. All right. First of all, I love the introduction. I usually don't go into detail uh, with Kareem Abouze's introductions, but he did such a beautiful job introducing this chapter that I basically copied and pasted it. So let's take a look at his introduction. He explains that entertainment plays a significant role in shaping our beliefs and shaping our attitudes and our behaviors. And in today's modern world, movie, cinema, soap operas, music, all of this stuff is we're surrounded by it, it's everywhere. And it's become a popular source of amusement and recreation for people of all backgrounds. I mean, any person that tells you that they're, you know, they're not influenced by movies or, or soap operas or, or even music, they're lying because that's the human nature. That's part of the human nature to be influenced by these things. But as Muslims, we have to always implement the principles of El Wala, Well Bara in everything, including entertainment. Just like we had to implement it in our sports. You know, we can watch sports. We can participate in sports if you a man publicly. Women, not publicly. But a woman can do it in private at home. As Muslims, we can watch sports. We can participate in sports as long as we implement allegiance and disassociation to disassociate from that which uh, impacts our Islamic morality, our Islamic values. Well, the same with the entertainment. So in this chapter, what Sheikh Kareem Abu Zaid does is he explores the entertainment field. He's gonna focus on movies. He's going to focus on soap operas. He's going to focus on all that type of stuff. And he's going to dive into the influence that these types of media have on society and how they impact us individually. 
A lot of people use entertainment as an escape. I know I do. I use entertainment as an escape. You know, I spend uh, 90% of my time, 90% of my time is spent teaching Islam on the internet. You guys know I basically live on this internet. Okay. That's stressful. That takes a lot out of me, but I do it because it keeps me focused on a law and doesn't, it keep prevents me from succumbing to my own emotions of loneliness. By me sitting here teaching Islam, I'm thinking about nothing but Allah and the prophet and the companions. That gives me no time to focus on my state, my loneliness, or whatever I'm dealing with in my personal life. So when I turn the computer off, I need an escape. I need a way to escape from the reality, the hardship of life, to escape from the fitna of life. So, you know, music, movies, Entertainment becomes a means of that. So a lot of us are going to have to implement wella wella bara in that. And in this chapter, again, uh, uh, Sheikh Kareem is going to also break down the rulings. When we talk about the Islamic rulings, what did Allah say about movies? What did Allah say about soap operas? What did Allah say about music? What did Allah say? What did Allah say? And how did the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam explain it? And how did the companions understand it? And again, this is Layla. You with me? I don't deal with no meth apps. You guys know that. I could care less what the four imams got to say about anything. I'm going to tell you the understanding of those companions, the originals. Just like yesterday when I did the how to pray class. Remember, we went, came over uh, how to pronounce the ikama, and that's going to be on the quiz tomorrow. We talked about how there are three different ways in which the ikama can be pronounced. The third way is from... Imam Malik. Imam Malik said, Kakamit to Salat should only be recited once. He said, because that's what he heard some people do when he was the governor of Medina. But like I told you, that's Imam Malik's view. I don't care what he said. There's no hadith from the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that says that, that Kakamata Salat is only recited once. And that was not the understanding nor practice of any of the companions. They said there's none, none of the original companions were known to say Kakamata Salat once. So that's an example as to why I don't care what anyone else has to say. So even in this book, if, uh, if any rulings or any Islamic verdicts that are presented, they're going to be based on what Allah said, based on what the prophet said, with the understanding of the companions. I'm going to give you the companions understanding of those verses and those rules. I don't care about the four imams because they didn't get a lot of stuff right. I'm sorry. They're not the companions. And I don't care about the third generation either. When I got the first, I'm not going to tell you what the third generation said. I'm not going to tell you what the second generation said. I'm going to keep it with the first. Because Allah says that. Allah says no one understands this religion better than those original companions. That's how you keep it mechocytic. That class is tonight. That's why I tell y'all my teachings are mechocytic. Based on the first, the originals. I don't even use the second or third generation. I don't have to. When Ibn Abbas speaks, everybody else shut up. If Aisha speaks, everybody else that came after them shut up. If Umar speaks, everybody came after them shut up. If Abu uh, uh, Sufyan speaks, whoever came after him, shut up. Khalid bin Wali, the rest of them, shut up. Those originals. I'm going to give you their opinions, their understanding. All right. So I like this introduction. 
<clears throat> that he put together. And uh, I want you guys to pay attention to this hadith. This hadith uh, from Anas. And by the way, Anas was the young boy that we spoke about. Uh, he was the uh, nephew of Maimuna. May Allah be pleased with her. He was the one that we spoke mentioned yesterday when I did my pre-class uh, speech uh, about the prophet visiting all the wives in one night. <clears throat> okay, Anas tells us that the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, when Allah created Adam in paradise, he left him in the form he created him in as long as he desired to leave him. In other words, for however long he decided to leave him in that state. And then Shaitan began to go around, to walk around Adam, looking him over. And when he saw that Adam, alayhi salam, had a hollow body, he realized that Adam was a weak creature. This hadith here from Anas serves as a reminder of the vulnerability that we have as humans. We're weak. We're not strong. Okay? Our nature, we're weak by nature. That's why Allah says in the Quran that as human beings, we're criminal by nature. Okay? So, Shaitan recognized our weakness and he knew at that moment that he could be a great influence on Adam, a great influence on any of Adam's descendants too. And Shaitan knows how to get to us. And remember, Allah has put a jinn, a shayateen, a devil. All of us have a devil attached to us when we reach the age of puberty. That devil knows our strengths. He knows our weaknesses. That devil hoovers around in our hearts looking for reasons to try to take us away from Allah. And so they know that one of the number way, one ways to do it is through entertainment, through music, through movies and all of that. One of the kids asked the other day, why is music haram? Allah tells us in Quran, because it becomes a distraction away from him and shaitan will use it against us. Okay, so anything that's entertaining becomes a tool that shaitan can use to hurt us and take us away from Allah. Okay, and we have to remember that Allah in his wisdom, he has provided us with the way to nourish ourselves the way to protect ourselves against shaitan. This is the beauty of Allah. Allah is all about check and balance. Allah did not give too much power to any of his creation over the rest. He taught us how to protect ourselves against shaitan. Just like a woman and husband, your husband and wife, we complement each other. A woman has rights, the man has rights, balance. Your husband doesn't have all this power over you that some of these brothers want to make you think he does. You obey your husband, but you obey him only in what Allah commanded you to obey him in. That's it. I don't obey him in everything else. He can't tell me to jump off the bridge. He can't tell me to not wear hijab. He can't tell me that I can't uh, wash my dishes with dove. No, this ain't got nothing to do with that. I obey you in what Allah commanded me to obey you in, brother. There's common sense. There's a thin, thin line between obedience and stupidity. Y'all know that? There's a thin line between obedience and stupidity. The only one we obey in totality is Allah. Don't get it twisted. So, the Quran serves as our guidance. The Quran enlightens our hearts. The Quran purifies our soul. And the Quran offers us a compass to navigate through life because the Quran are the words of Allah, not the creation. 
of Allah. It's the words of Allah. This is another Aqidah issue. The Quran. These are the words of Allah. Allah speaking to us. Okay? And if we listen to what he's saying and apply it to our lives, we'd be able to overcome whatever trials he sends. That's what the Prophet وسلم, meant. Again, fall back on la ilaha illallah. If your Aqidah, your belief system is correct and you understand that the Quran is not a creation of Allah, if you understood that the Quran is really the words of Allah speaking to you, then you will pay attention and do what he says do. And you'll be able to handle whatever comes your way. Allah says, for example, sickness, disease comes from me. I spread disease through the wings of the jinn. Okay? But I never send a sickness. I never send a disease without sending a treatment for it. So take the treatment. I told you COVID people, people still hating me to this day. I lost some students here because I got some students that believe in conspiracies. They really believe that there's a conspiracy for man. They don't understand that Allah is the creator of all things good and evil. They believe that man is the creator of evil and that man conspires to try to kill them for some reason. I don't know where this type of thinking comes from, but I got some students that stopped coming to me and listening to me because I told them to take the COVID shot. I didn't make the law up. Allah did. Allah says take the treatment. I didn't make that up. Polio. Allah sent polio. What happened? He sent the treatment. Allah sent tuberculosis. He sent the treatment. Allah sends the flu. He sends the treatment. COVID is the same thing. It's just a virus. He sent the treatment. You know, take the shot. It'll help you get over it. And it has. That's been proven. People who've taken the COVID shots, when they get the disease, they don't uh, succumb to it as easily as the others who don't take the shot. Just like the flu shot. Those of us who do take the flu shot, we don't succumb to it as easily as the others. The treatment comes from Allah. And as Allah says, take the treatment and maybe I'll send a cure. The people took the treatment for the polio. The people took the treatment for the tuberculosis. The people took the treatment for scurvy. The people took the treatment. And what happened? Allah sent the cure for it. Now they just give you and vaccinate the babies. They don't get polio. They don't get tuberculosis. But I got some students that turned against me. You know, like I'm teaching some witchcraft and all I'm did, I'm, I gained, I'm quoting the law from the Quran. I didn't make the laws and rules, the law did, but they got mad at me. You know, that's because they don't understand their belief system is not as it should be. The Quran, this is, these are the words of Allah. And if we listen to Allah, do what Allah says do, then we be able to overcome whatever he sends. Evil and good come from Allah, not man. Like Allah said, if all the creation were to come together to harm you, they wouldn't be able to lift a finger to do anything to you unless I allowed it. That's the Quran, that ain't me. I'm not making these verses up. Why get mad at Layla? But they do. They get mad at me on the women. These are the women. That's why I don't have that many female followers. Most of my followers are men. 
Even though my DAO was directed towards women, I only got 20 women that follow me. And those are my 20 students. The rest are all men. The other 70 some percent are men because the women are too sick, too jealous, too whatever. But anyway, the Quran, the Quran serves as our guidance. It enlightens our hearts, purifies our souls, and is the compass how to navigate through life, how to get through marriage, how to get through divorce, how to get through earthquakes, how to handle war, how to handle sickness, how to handle good times. So we have to balance and prioritize our spiritual well-being as Muslims. We have to engage with the Quran on a regular basis, reflect upon its teachings. We have to make that connection with Allah on a regular basis. This is how we remain strong and navigate through life. Everybody understand that? So now let's get to the nitty gritty here. What is Islam's stance on entertainment? What does Allah say? I don't care what the four imams got to say. I don't care what Sheikh so-and-so said. What does Allah say about entertainment? Well, I want you guys to ponder these verses. Allah says, in the interpretation of the meaning, verily the hearing and the sight and the heart of each of those, meaning each one of us <coughs> will be questioned by Allah. Y'all ponder this verse? Ponder the words of Allah. It's not the creation of Allah. And maybe that's where my students fell short, the ones that stopped listening to me after the COVID. They don't understand that the Quran is not the creation of Allah. And I know that they believe that because I know what imams they listen to. And those imams got it twisted. Allah is telling us right here in this verse that whatever we hear, whatever we see, it, we're going to be questioned about it. On the day of judgment, again, you will never understand the Quran until you understand the Hadith. The Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, explained this verse to us because the companions asked him, what does this mean? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, your hands, your tongue, your eyes, your ears will be a witness either for you or against you on the day of judgment. When we stand before a law on the day of judgment, we're going to be questioned about what we saw that we shouldn't have been looking at. We're going to be questioned about what we said that we shouldn't have said. We're going to be questioned about all of that. Our hands will do the talking. This is explained by the prophet and the authentic hadith. That's why y'all have to learn them hadith. What's the source of this one? Sahih Bukhari. And it's also in Muslim. And it's also in Termini. Okay. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that when we stand before Allah on the day of judgment, our body parts will testify as to what we did that we should not have done. So that's what this means. If we believe that the Quran is the words of Allah, not the creation, then we wouldn't get angry when our teacher tells us something that Allah said. OK. Also, pay attention to this. Another verse. Allah says in the interpretation of the meaning. Tell the believing men to lower their gaze. And protect their private parts again. This is for you, brothers. A lot of you have been posting up on social media the videos of the Olympics. That African-American girl with her husband. The, her, she's married to the Caucasian man who doesn't have legs. Both of them are Olympic winners. 
A lot of you have said, forget her husband. You brothers been posting her pictures all up on the internet talking about, look at her body, man. She got some legs on her. She's a runner. Of course she's got lean legs. She better not have any fat on her if she's a runner. But the thing is, what were you doing looking at her? This is where the question comes in about sports. There's nothing wrong with participating and looking at sports as long as you ain't looking at what you shouldn't be looking at. Why were you brothers watching the women run down track when none of those women are dressed properly? In fact, the Olympics have become so publicized, it's a fashion show now. The women, they wear all kind of crazy stuff out there. Some of the women, you know, run without nothing on but a bra. What are you brothers doing looking at those women? Tell the believing men to lower their gaze and protect your private parts. That's the meaning of this hadith that so many of you African-American men twist around and weaponize convert women with. You tell Muslim women when they convert to Islam, oh, welcome to Islam. You know 50% of your marriage a uh, 50% of the dean is marriage, so you need to get married right now. You got these women thinking that if they marry, Allah is going to give them 50% of the knowledge and understanding of Islam. It's going to fall out the sky. Oh, yeah. You African-American brothers tell use that to weaponize new shahadas. There's nothing that you can do that's going to give you 50% of the knowledge of Islam, especially not having sexual relations. That hadith is talking about this verse here. Save your soul from the hellfire. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said the number two reasons as to why most of us will end up in hell. It's because we fail to control our tongue and we fail to control our private parts. Get married. That will take care of sex. And then you can focus on what you say out your mouth. That's the meaning of that hadith. It has nothing to do with Allah sending all the knowledge of the religion to you because you have sex. Oh, no, because you marry. No. You brother, stop using that hadith to get what you want from women and focus on this verse, lower your gaze. You shouldn't have been watching the women do track. You shouldn't have been watching the women swim. What are you doing looking at women who are naked swimming? What are you doing looking at women who are naked walking on a balancing beam? What are you doing looking at men who are naked swimming? Hello, let's not forget the LGBTQ community. And it's rampant here with the Muslims too in America. Oh yeah, we got a lot of that homosexuality going on in the massages. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, LGBTQs. You had no business looking at the men. The naked men do the swimming either. Subhana Allah. This is Islam's stance on entertainment. What is Allah's stance on entertainment? His stance is you're going to be held accountable for everything that you see, everything that you hear that you shouldn't have been listening to, everything that you say that you shouldn't have been saying. And you're supposed to lower your gaze to not look at those things that Allah commanded you not to look at. Do you guys understand these verses? This is Allah's stance on entertainment, not Layla's. And also we have a hadith where the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah has decreed for the son of Adam his portion of adultery that he will commit. And the adultery of the two eyes is to look at something with lust. The adultery of the tongue is to say things you shouldn't say that are obscene. The soul yearns and craves 
what the passions will indulge in or deny. Remember the human soul is criminal by nature. The human soul, as Allah says in the Quran, is attracted to what is bad for it, what is dirty. So this hadith and these verses, this is the stance that Allah takes on entertainment. Now, is though are these verses saying that everything is haram? No. It's they're telling us that which is sinful, that which is lustful, that which contradicts Allah's laws, Allah's uh, uh, commands. So we have to learn how to implement el wala wal bara with entertainment, just like we had to learn how to do it with sports. Just like you brothers shouldn't have been looking at those women run track. What about movies and stuff? Okay, if the movie has foulness in it, should you be watching it? If the music has foulness in it, should you listen to it? If the poetry, let's put it this way, the poems and nasheeds are poems that you're listening to are filled with vulgarity and obscenity, should you listen to it? So again, it's essential to balance and prioritize our spiritual well-being by making sure that we don't listen to that, which can take us away from Allah, or watch that, that can take us away. So here's the answer. What is Allah's stance on entertainment? Remember, Allah is the creator of everything. Allah is the creator of good and evil. Allah is the creator of technology. He created this internet for us. He gave us all of this, the movies, the drama, all of that. Allah is the creator of everything. What's his stance on it? Well, if watching a movie, a soap opera, or listening to music that contains immoral content, if it has immoral content in it, then we shouldn't do it. It's forbidden. That's clear, guys. Watching sex tapes. Watching a movie where men and women are having sex. Watching a movie where women are kissing women, men are kissing men. We shouldn't watch that stuff, okay? Selling drugs. A movie of people doing drugs, selling drugs. We shouldn't do that. Movies of people killing each other for no reason. I ain't talking about history. I ain't talking about a documentary. I'm talking about just making a movie to kill, crush, destroy, you know, that uh, for no reasons. You know, we have to stay away from that. Remember, guys, Allah created us. He put us here on this earth. He surrounded us with all these things. And he told us to enjoy the good things here in this life. Just stay away from the bad, okay? So I can watch a movie as long as there is no bad in it. That's why Layla Nasheba, I am a paranormal person. I'm into paranormal. Werewolves, vampires. That type of stuff. I get off in them type of movies, you know, because it's an escape for me. I need, I'm surrounded. I hear all the fitna, all the bad things from you guys. So when I turn my computer off, I want to escape, to escape the reality. And I want to escape the reality of my personal life. You know, the drama I got there, the disappointment there. So I'll put on a fantasy movie, you know, flying werewolves with me on their back, you know, with a sword, you know. You know, I'll put, I, I escape that way, okay? I'm not going to sit up and watch some filthy stuff. I'm not going to sit up and watch a sex movie that's only going to call me to my desires, that's going to make me cry and make me sad and make me depressed because I don't have a husband, you know? So that brings us to the quiz for